as people say, oh, I hear this a lot, I can't grow anything, I'm no good, this is too hard, I've tried and failed. I say, come and listen to a speaker who said, I, I didn't do too good until I learned about square foot gardening. And then I think Susan will impress you to know it's a great method that, in Susan's case, turned her gardening experience from challenging to productive and, and enjoyable. So Susan James not only is a certified master, um, instructor of square foot gardening, she learned from the inventor himself, Mel, Balthar, Mel Bartholomew, and also in place it not only at her home, but also uh, at her day job, if you will, at the Milwaukee School of the Outdoors. So thank you very much, Susan James, for joining us tonight. Okay. What would everyone like? Lights on or down? Up? That's fine. And I will use the microphone. A lot of times when I do presentations, I just speak with my own voice, unaided, uh, but there's a lot of background noise here. So I, it is indeed a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, when Jean contacted me several months ago, it seemed so far out into the future, and then all of a sudden, it's here. And what a glorious day, actually week, this has been. It feels like spring is here, and I'm ready, actually, to start getting some things planted in my strip of gardens at home, believe it or not. Um, and as Jean said, I was exposed to square foot gardening through actually a home garden show down in Columbus where just by coincidence we had gone to look at other things and walked by, I don't know how many of you have been down to that home garden show, but they have a big stage where they have different people presenting every hour. And we heard somebody speaking and Steve and I went up on the stage and, and sat down and there was Mel Bartholomew presenting his method of gardening, square foot gardening. And he created, developed that method, I wanted to say back in the 80s. I'm really bad with dates right now. Um, it was actually on PBS. Does anybody remember that show from PBS? I'm believing it was mid-80s. And back then, square foot gardening was at ground level. It was actually, you were amending the soil in your um, garden. I mean, it wasn't a soil mix. It was actually amending what you had. And there have been a lot of improvements made since then. In fact, there's been the initial book and now even a, a revision to that book, the second edition to that book. Um, and I do have a copy of that uh, if anyone cares to take a look at it. So I'm going to go on and get started. If anybody wants to speak with me afterwards, I'm really not in any hurry this evening. Um, so without any more delay, so what is square foot gardening? It is truly just a simple, productive gardening method. And some of you, I know this is sponsored by the Master Gardeners, some of you are going to be very skeptical of this. I'll be quite honest with you. You're, the hardest wins are the people that have been gardening their whole life the traditional way, because that's the way we've always done it, way. And my mother, who will be 80 this year, still will not try this. She is just, this is how I do it, Susie. And that's okay. Um, but if you have perhaps a family member that is restricted to a wheelchair, this will work for you. If you have a family member that just can't get down on their knees or bend over, this is a method that will work for them. Perhaps you live in an apartment complex and all you have is concrete. This will work for you. Um, so I've got a lot of pictures, um, most of which are Square Foot Garden Foundation's pictures. But then at the end, since this is a community garden event, I did also include some pictures from community gardens that I'm aware of, Toledo and down in Georgia. Um, and the one down in Georgia I actually had kind of a hand in. So it is a, a method developed by Mel Bartholomew. He was actually a civil engineer, and so when he shared that, I kind of felt a kinship. I'm a degree in engineer as well. And so I kind of think analytically, you know, what will work, what won't work. And he did the same thing. When he retired, he wanted to try gardening and found it really wasn't any fun. And everybody kept saying, well, we do it this way because that's just the way it's done. Or we've always done it that way. And he, being an engineer, said there's got to be a better way. And so he started playing around with different methods and came up with what is now known as square foot gardening. I was really impressed when I first heard him uh, about the humanitarian efforts that his foundation 
uh, pursue, they literally go worldwide teaching people how to make food for themselves. And at no cost. I mean, it, that's what he promoted. You know, sometimes we need to make money for doing what we do. Other times we just do it because. And that's why I'm here. You know, when Jean told me that this was a free event, I thought, this is something I want to be part of. Because hopefully some of you will walk away from here saying, oh, I can do this. And it might help put food on your table. So Mel likes to say, no weeding, no digging, no tilling, no kidding. Now, I can tell you there truly is no tilling. There will be a little bit of digging just to level out your site. But what it have to be, especially if you're dealing with a relatively level site to begin with. No weeding, I can tell you that the wind is going to blow seeds into your garden. Birds are going to drop seeds into your garden, but I can weed my three four by four beds in 15 minutes. My experience before square foot gardening was not good. And you'll see a picture of sort of like what my garden looked like on up here, way overgrown by midsummer. You just couldn't keep up with it. Um, and that's no fun. So if you tell me, you know, you'll be done in 15 minutes and it's very loose soil to where everything just pulls out very easily, I'm sold on that. And that's the case. So what are the advantages? Uh, it does definitely save time. It saves a lot of water. In fact, let me turn this around a little for some of you. Um, saves a lot of space, about 20% of the space that you would normally need. I'll try to back up here a little. 10% um, of the water, that's all you need is 10% of the water. So this is really good for areas where, let's say you're on a well, I'm on a well, and I am not an advocate of watering my lawn because I want my well water to drink. Uh, so 10% of the water really speaks to me. 5% of the seeds, and I think our speaker before me already addressed how you save seeds, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. And 2% of the work, and I can definitely testify to that as well. It is just like any other gardening method. You need to think about where you put your garden. So you still want six to eight hours of sunshine. You want to stay away from trees, stay away from low areas or areas prone to puddling. And unlike other gardening methods where you're typically away from the house because it's taking up so much space, try to put your beds close to your house. Now, the garden that was there before Steve and I bought our, our house was far away from the house, and we live on a hill. It had already been leveled out by the previous owners. We used that, that previous garden, but I really regret putting my beds out in that garden because I have to carry water up there. I kind of regret that. Uh, any new garden beds that I put in are going to be closer to the house just because if they're closer, you're going to notice what's going on with your plants. If it's far away, that's when the garden tends to get away from us because it's not in our mind, because it's not in our sight, out of sight, out of mind. So if you have those square foot beds close to your house, and it is possible with square foot gardening because of the method itself, you're going to be more likely to pay attention and then weed just that one garden bed at a time. Maybe I'm going to weed this square foot bed um, on Monday and then I'll have more time on Wednesday to weed one of the others. You're going to be able to keep up with it better and want to because it's going to be close to your house. So there's lots of different ways you can go um, and so the pictures I'm going to be showing will give some examples of what you can do. Um, and what other people have done, actually. So it can be small or large. It can be uh, garden vegetables. It can be just flowers. And in fact, Mel really encourages people to do a mix of flowers with their vegetables. Those flowers are gonna draw in pollinators that your vegetable plants need. So definitely consider planting some, some flowers in with those vegetables. And I want you to notice that um, the picture on the left is on a deck. So you, you've definitely got that option of putting that little bit of the garden space. If all you've got is a deck and a really small backyard, you can still do that. I would caution you to try to get some kind of pan underneath that and drill holes in the bottom of your box. You're going to do a box very similar to what I have here. Drill some holes in it so your water can, can drain. But keep in mind it's going to discolor your deck if you don't have something under there to catch that water. 
definitely space saving. If you've got, um, and I grew up inner city Columbus with a fence very much like that in a garage right next to it. Um, if all you've got is a fence row, do even just one foot out or two feet out, whatever you have, and along that line. <coughs> a balcony is a perfect place for a square foot garden. Rooftop is, a, is an option if that's all you've got, or an apartment building, you know, the, the uh, top level, the roof of a level, an apartment building. Patio, and you'll notice here that I've got boxes made of wood, of stone, and of whatever you might have. And I will tell you that Mel is a big proponent of making your boxes out of whatever you have. If you go to, and I need to get to, uh, Habitat for Humanity has a shop here. Uh, I'm wanting to say Lex Spring Hill and, yeah. yeah. They supposedly are selling, you know, lumber. I want to check that out. Uh, get it from a, a construction site where they have scraps that they're just going to throw away. Uh, get it wherever you can get it. And if it's blocks, do it out of blocks. The big thing that defines a square foot garden is the soil mix, which we'll talk at length about, and a permanent grid. You want a grid on that to, to define it as a square foot garden, and there's a good reason for that, which we'll get to. So, I've got slides on each of these, and I think there's a handout as well that might outline this. I, I did send that on to Jean. Um, You've got your layout. Think about what you want in each of those squares. And those squares should be nominally 12 inches by 12 inches. You're going to think about the layout of your individual box and of the overall boxes if you're going to do more than, than one box. Um, how your boxes are made, what size aisles you're going to have. And that's important, especially if it's in an area where you need to mow. Think about the width of your mower so that you're not building boxes filling them with soil and then say, oops, I can't mow there. The soil mix, your grid, selection of good plants, and I'm not going to get too much into companion planting, but I'm a real advocate of that, and I try to do that in, in my garden beds. Planting those plants, um, or start or the seeds, and watering them, the care of those plants, and then harvesting them, which is, of course, the most fun. So when you lay out, think in squares, not in rows. In fact, right after I started doing this, I love Mother Earth Maze. They gave me the perfect picture. If you don't put a grid on, you can still have a raised box. You can still have Mel's mix. But if you don't put the grid on, this is what you will end up with. Just because we've always done it that way. But you're not going to maximize your yield on that box if you plant it this way. So just keep, it, keep that in mind. Sure. <laughs> She was asking what, what would be hard to, to mix your soil with. We'll get to that. Exactly. You won't need to. Um, so your typical garden tends to be about 20 feet by 35 feet, which is about what mine is at home. And to grow that same amount of space, all you need is 140 square feet with a square foot garden because of how you're planting it. So you're going to build square or rectangular boxes and they're going to hold a new soil mix. And that soil mix is really important. I have, uh, for a number of years, I did this presentation down at Trinity Farm south of Belleville. And I had somebody come back to me the following year after, after doing it the first year. Somebody came back and she says, you know, I, I did it, nothing grew. Every, and it was like hard as mud, it, it hardly rock. And I said, well, what did you use you know, for your soil? Did you really do the mixture? She says, well, I got this soil mix at, at, you know, I don't know which big box store it was. And I said, that's your problem. You can't get just a soil mix. You really do have to do the Mel's mix the way his recipe is. So, um, and we'll get to that particular mix uh, in one of the upcoming slides. But do think about that. You're going to build square or rectangular boxes holding that new soil mix above the ground. So you're not amending your, your, your current soil, you're, you're making a new soil. 
out of any material that you have. Do use untreated lumber. And I think, is organic gardening kind of a push here? I thought I read something to that effect. Um, if you use treated lumber, you're going to, especially for foods that you're going to eat, uh, plates that you're going to eat the food product of, you're going to risk getting some of those chemicals into your plant. It's going to leach in with, anytime you have water and chemicals, it's going to leach in. So use untreated lumber. We're going to hard level surface when you're putting that box together. So don't think that you're going to drive those screws into your box to put it together out on uneven ground. It just isn't going to work. Been there, done that. Um, work on the, the concrete or even a gravel surface would be better than the, the ground. So if you have a garage, that's ideal because that's going to give you a nice level surface to make sure everything is even. Definitely rotate your corners for stability and if you look at the box I have here that's a sample, those corners are rotated. So if you notice, and sorry for standing in front of this, this one goes clear to the top here, and then it just butts in. And you're, I'll leave this up for people to look at when I'm done. The screws are driven in from the side, on this side, and then from the top here. That's rotating your corners, and that's really important for stability of your box. If you don't do that, your box is gonna wiggle, and you're gonna end up with less than square. Um, don't skimp. Sometimes we like to say, well, all, I'm gonna, all I really need is two screws per corner. Take my word for it, you need at least three. And if you're going to use more than, let's say you decide you want a deeper box and you're actually gonna use like 10 inch lumber, you're gonna want more than three to one. So don't skip on your, on your screws, they're pretty cheap anyways, and definitely pre-drill your holes. Okay, so don't think that, oh, I've got this power drill, I'm gonna just drive the screws in, your wood will splinter and you're going to have problems with those holes then. So pre-drill your holes, then drill, drive the screws in. And here's some examples of uh, what Mel actually provided. Some examples of, of what you want to do. So your box size should not be any wider than four feet. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, a couple reasons. He measured people's arms, and most adults can reach in two feet. And sure, there are some that can measure reach in more, but on average, two feet is the reach. Some of you that already garden probably know that you don't want to step on your soil once you've amended it or planted anything. You don't want to lean on it. If it's more than two feet, you're going to end up supporting yourself with your hand on that soil mix. And then you've got really compressed soil and it's not good for the plant to, or plant roots to get any kind of uh, air or even the movement of water. So you, you don't want more than two feet um, in terms of your reach in. So that's where he gets no wider than four feet. And in fact, for children, if you've gotten, this is a family event, if you're going to make a box for your child to take care of and get them engaged in, in gardening, I would start with a two by two, quite honestly. That's going to give them more than enough fun to, to plant their own plants or seeds, and then they can really tend to it themselves. The other reason you don't want more than four foot, because you might say, well, I can build eight foot by four foot. The thing is, somewhere along there, you're going to have trouble reaching. And I've done this. I, my very first bed was six feet long because I used an old picnic bench. I ended up leaning because I needed that support halfway through. So if you want more than four foot, then do say two four foots, or two three foots, or a three and a two, uh, because you're going to want that support, the wood support in there, especially when, when it comes to putting your grid down. Okay, your aisles, as I mentioned earlier, you want to think about what's going to look good, what you can tend to, what you can maintain. Um, when we put our square foot beds on the roof of the outdoor school, because we do have a sod roof on part of our building, uh, I actually checked with our maintenance man, and I asked, okay, how wide is the deck of the mower? And when I've done this presentation to school teachers, I've always said, you have to check with maintenance first, because if you put something in that they can't mow around, 
you're going to be told to take it back out. So always think about the, the size of the mower. Um, if you, let's say, you live in an apartment complex and you've gotten permission from the landlord to put something like this in, check and see what they need. Keeping everybody happy from the start is definitely better than trying to amend things later. So the soil mix, here's what's really important. You want a third peat moss, one third coarse vermiculite, and one third blended compost. The peat moss, and, and I've had people say, well, how is this a sustainable gardening method? Well, peat is, there's a limited amount of peat moss in the, in the world. Well, you're only gonna use that peat moss one time. You're not gonna keep adding to it. Once you've made your soil mix, that's it. There is a substitute though. You can also use cocoa corn, and that is the, uh, a product from the husk of a coconut. I've not ever used that. I just found out about this option this year, and I'm kind of curious to, to see how it works. But the purpose of the peat moss is to hold that moisture in the soil mix. That's what's going to help you to use a lot less water, is, is that, that peat moss holding the, the water in the soil mix. It does improve the soil um, as well. So coarse vermiculite, and how many of you remember back when they were saying vermiculite was, would cause cancer? Anybody remember that? Um, all of those mines where vermiculite was brought from that caused cancer, those mines have been closed. And I did a lot of research on this before I started doing square foot gardening with the students at the outdoor school because we literally built those beds with students and I was not about to use a substance that was going to endanger them. And there really is no vermiculite around that's, that's got that, those carcinogens anymore. Um, it is a mica rock. It's a rock that's been heated, superheated, and it's very, very light. So plant roots need space. They need space to, to, for the water to get in there, they need space for air, and that vermiculite is going to cause that space to stay there. So, like, you asked about how are you going to turn it up? If it's in a box, you can't use your rototiller, you're not going to need a rototiller. Because when I go out to my gardens here in the next week or two, I can take a plastic trowel and break that up. A plastic trowel will break that up Usually I can do it just with my hands um, because it's going to stay loose and friable forever with those components in it. And I've had my bed since 2009. So the vermiculite's also going to hold some water, but its primary purpose is to, to make that space to keep it loose so that the, the plants can breathe. Compost is a really important part, and that is what you're going to use more of each time you plant a new crop. So the vermiculite is a one-time use, the peat moss is a one-time use, compost is a continual. That's what's providing the nutrients. So those of you that are familiar with adding fertilizer to help your plants grow, this is our substitute for fertilizer. You should not ever have to use fertilizer, per se, in a square foot garden, but you will want to use a really good mix of compost. And what Mel recommends is at least five different ingredients, five different components to your uh, compost. So if you've got friends that farm, let's say maybe you have different livestock animals, getting that manure from those different animals, that's a great place to start. I love mushrooms, uh, the mushroom compost that some of the local stores sell. Um, I also have what's called a vermicomposter, and if you're interested in finding out how you can make a vermicomposter, mine is in my laundry room right off my kitchen. There is no smell involved. I can tell you that, and we've got four or five of them at the outdoor school where we grow red worms to feed our animals. So if you're interested in making your own compost there right in your house, in your apartment, I can give you some information about that later. But you do need a good source of compost because you can really truly get three different crops from one box in one year. So if I plant, let's say spinach, here in the next couple weeks, I can use that same square, that's a leaf crop, I can use that same square to maybe, let's see, carrots are kind of a cold weather crop too. Maybe radishes, plant some radishes after that, that's a root crop. And then plant something that's maybe going to be of a fruit crop, maybe like some peas in the fall. 
uh, that will grow, especially if I cover it. The first year I, I did that, I, I, I was picking things clear until late November. Believe it or not, three different crops in one year. So definitely make your own compost because you're going to need that. If you don't want to make your own compost, you can go and buy it. Just like I was saying, uh, check out the different big box stores. Check out Sandy Hill. Check out Wayne's. They all sell different things uh, that might appeal to you. Definitely read the ingredients. You want it to be just that compost. You don't want any soil in that because a manufacturer's idea of soil is usually not the very best thing. You just want a compost, like the manure. So when you make that mills mix, plan to get a big tarp. You're not going to do it on just your ground. Get a big tarp or a big piece of plastic, um, and the bigger the better. Spread that large tarp out, and then dump equal portions of your ingredients on that. Now you're going to say, well, Susan, how on earth am I going to know a third and a third and a third? Well, I, I just use buckets. If I, you know, take my compost and, and kind of, I wouldn't necessarily pour it in, I'd kind of shovel it in so that it's not getting compacted in the process. I can use a five gallon bucket and, and a little bit at a time put three buckets of my peat moss, three buckets of vermiculite, three buckets of compost, mix that up and then just keep adding until I get the amount that I need for my box. So you don't have to have anything that actually measures as long as it's equal portions. Break up those clumps of peat moss. Your vermiculite is not going to be in clumps anyways, but your peat moss might be, your compost might be, so break those up. I mix those up, and I would recommend if you can having a hose that you can mist, because your vermiculite is very dusty. And even though it doesn't have carcinogens in it, any kind of dust in your lungs is not good for you. So be ready with either a mask or a, a garden hose that you can mist uh, your mix in the process. And you're going to use either a garden rake or you can see how they're um, pulling their tarp and, and mixing it that way. Lots of different ways and we used all of those with the kids at the outdoor school. They had a blast. Shovel in about two inches of soil mix at a time. Add some water. The key to this mix is thoroughly wetting it as you're putting it in because you want it to be wet. That way that uh, the uh, peat moss is going to have enough moisture to begin with and it's going to hold it. It's going to evaporate anyways over time, but you, you're going to be watering your garden to replace it. Just approximately two inches at a time and you're, then you're going to eventually fill up to six inches. So you're going to repeat that three times. I wouldn't necessarily use that. I, um, you're talking perlite and just, you could, you could use perlite. Um, Mel recommends the vermiculite, but you could use perlite if that's what you've got. You want something that's going to, to create some space. Here's one example of a grid. Um, and the Square Foot Gardening Foundation does sell a lot of different products. I actually, the last bed I put in last year was one that I purchased from them actually over at uh, Kidron at Layman's, they had it marked down and I thought, oh, I'm buying that. And it had a really nice little grid on it. I'm not sure how long it's going to last, but we'll see. Um, you can use lath wood. You can use old vinyl blinds. And I actually kind of like that method so far the best. If you don't have any of those things, and Mel really encourages a permanent grid, but let's face it, we might not either have it or have the funds to purchase anything like that. You can use string. String is less permanent though. Just bear that in mind. String is less permanent, more likely to come loose, and you really want your grids there. Um, and ideally, if you want to take some pride in what you have, uh, a permanent grid is going to look a lot better too. And without a grid, I showed you the, the mother of news, it's not a, a square foot garden without that grid. So there's, there's the difference in, in the visual. You're going to select your crops, and quite honestly, Mel swears you can grow sweet corn in a square foot garden. I'm serious. I have not personally done that, but he guarantees that you can grow sweet corn in a square foot garden. 
Um, some of the crops that you might need to, a digger, uh, a, a deeper area for the roots, and there's not that many of them. Believe it or not, the roots will go out instead of down. Um, some of them you might want what you call a tower, and I think I have a picture of that coming up. That you just kind of add in, just a little one by one tower to give you that extra depth. Or you can build an entire bed that's a little bit deeper. But you're going to select what you think you're going to use. Select foods that you're going to eat. Um, and plant. Now, the first few years that Steve and I planted the garden, we really went through the seed. Can anybody relate? I mean, when you're doing row gardening, you really are putting all those seeds in and then pulling out a bunch of plants. With this method, you're using three seeds in each hole. I've got seeds from probably three, four years ago, and yes, I'll have to test them and make sure that they're still good, but I kept them stored in a Ziploc bag down in a really cool basement. They probably will still be good. So you're going to use a lot less seed um, just with this method. So when you're thinking your spacing, you're going to want to think about a grid, a pattern. And this is where it's fun to get kids involved because they can draw in the soil with their, with their fingers. So if I've got, let's say, a broccoli, I'm only going to plant one broccoli in a square because any of you that are growing here are going to thin that to 12 inches. And that's how it goes. If you're thinning to 12 inches, you're only doing one in a square. Other crops, maybe head lettuce, I'm going to do four in a square. And I'm literally going to take my fingers and draw that grid on the soil. My grandkids love this. Nine to a square, 12 to a square. Now, quite honestly, when I'm growing, um, let's say, squashes, I'll be very honest, I grow my squashes out on hills. I don't put them in my box. Um, personally, I don't feel like I have the funds to dedicate a box to a squash, a four by four box, one box to a plant. I'm going to amend my hill and, and plant some of those things just in hills. Um, but pretty well everything else goes in my square foot bed. And I, I really do follow that planting method of, with the grids. Your leaf lettuces, and Mel will tell you this as well, leaf lettuces, you could just kind of broadcast over a square. And that's what I tend to do. I like to mix my leaf lettuces anyways. So there's your one per square. You're literally just going to use your finger to make a, a hole. And just in case you don't realize it, because I realize there might be some new gardeners here, you don't want to plant that seed very deep. I think the rule of thumb is about three times the size of the seed deep. That was another one of my visitors, one of my, my uh, people that had watched me one year, came back to Trinity Farms the next year. I planted it, the soil was fine, but nothing ever came up. And the more we talked, the more I brought out, you know, exactly how did you do it? And she says, I stuck my finger way down in and I put that seed in and I said, you mean your whole finger? And she says, yeah. Oh that plant never had a chance. <laughs> so you're not going to put the seeds very deep. You know, the smaller the seed, the less deep it needs to go. Um, so thinning to 12 inches would be your broccoli, cabbage, tomatoes, <laughs> eggplant, peppers. And I did, I, I love the square foot gardening for my tomatoes. Absolutely love it. And you combine 12 inch by 12 inch cages for those tomatoes. Four plants per square is going to be your leaf lettuce. Um, corn, chard, marigolds, and strawberries. Now, I have seriously done just broadcasting my leaf lettuce across, and it has worked just fine. So my experience is more of the head lettuce than leaf lettuce. Nine plants per, per square is going to be things like the bush beans, spinach, and beets. And I've grown all of those. 16 plants per square, things like carrots, radishes, and onions. And again, I've done all of these in my square foot garden, and it works wonderfully. This is um, one of the graphics from his book, um, and I like pictures, it, it really kind of works. You can look really quickly and don't have to read in depth. When you thin, because if you're planting, you know, several seeds in that hole, you are going to need to thin it to where there's just one plant in each hole. 
Um, don't pull that plant out because if you pull it out, you're disrupting the roots of all of the plant that you want to keep. So that's where you really only need, really truly, a trowel, a pair of scissors, and a pencil. If you don't want to get your hand dirty, use a pencil to make a little hole. Um, the trowel really will work in that soil mix, really truly. And the scissors to cut off whatever plants you don't want from that hole. I'm not going to go on about seed storage. You just heard about an hour presentation on that. But definitely you're going to be able to save your seeds from year to year in your packet because there are probably a thousand seeds in a packet. And if you're only using a few each year, um, you'll still, you'll probably, they'll get old on you. Um, Mel likes to promote using sun-warmed water. I have a well. That water is pretty cold and it can shock your plant. So if you have a bucket out that has some, some warmed water, it's, your plant's gonna like it better. He, he kind of gives the analogy that this plant is like your baby. Would you give your baby a cold bath? No. So try to give it some warmed water if you can. And around here we do have to think about mosquitoes, but if you put a couple drops of vegetable oil on top of on that bucket, those mosquito larvae can't survive. Put a couple drops of vegetable oil on, it's not going to hurt your water for the plants, and those, the larvae can't survive them. Um, you're not going to plant or water anything except where you have planted. So think about this. If you've got your permanent grid, you know where each of your squares begins and ends. I always mark my squares so that I know what's in there and what the pattern is. So if I've planted, what was in nine? I don't even remember. I know radishes is 16. Beans, yes, if I've planted beans, it's been a long day. <laughs> and when you work, we've got uh, about 86 graders there right now at the outdoor school, it's been a long day. Uh, if I've got beans planted here, as they're coming up, and I know that I've planted nine to a square, as it's coming up, I'm going to kind of remember what this pattern's like. Anything that's coming up anywhere else, I know it's a weed. Anybody here ever had trouble figuring out is it a weed or is it not a plant? This works, folks. It really works. So those of you that have struggled with gardening say, I just don't know what the plant is. Well, neither did I. I started to learn that, but I still run into some plants that I'm like, is it or isn't it? But then you look at, is it on my grid? Is it on the grid of what I planted? If it's not, it's most likely a weed. And I pull it. You're only going to water your plants that you planted. You're not going to water your weeds. And that's going to help keep the number of weeds down in your box. In terms of care, just like any other garden. You know, if you, uh, anybody familiar with what my mother always called me, called suckers on your tomato plant, you're, you're going to tend to your plants just like any other garden. Um, they, they still need looked at every day, and if you start seeing a plant that's looking unhealthy, definitely trim that off. Dispose of it somewhere other than your compost if it's looking unhealthy, because you really don't want to, to take your, your compost with anything that might affect everything. I know two years ago, I'm thinking it was two, no, it was just last year, Boy, did anybody else have trouble with their tomatoes last year? My cherry tomatoes did wonderfully. The regular tomatoes, full-size tomatoes, I didn't get a single tomato. It was awful. Yeah, everybody I've talked to, I think one person up in the Cleveland area that I know had success with his tomatoes. I was like, well, that's nice for you, Bruce, but I had nothing. Um, so I'm not sure what happened. A few years before that, there was a blank that hit all of the tomatoes. And, you know, I've gotten a few off. You really need to watch your plants. Even if you're not having to water very often, because honestly, with my schedule, if we've got a summer camp going on, I'm lucky to be home very much at all during the week. So my plants do not get watered every day. I try to walk up there, especially when I'm walking around with the dog, see it, how things look, feel the soils, feel how it feels. Um, but I might not get to water as often as I like, but I can tell you that I've never lost a plant because I didn't water it. 
because that the, the soil mix really does hold that moisture. So very few weeds, just to recap this, because there's no weed seed in vermiculite and peat moss. Your weed seeds are only gonna come through in your compost. Your compost pile, if you've done it right, is going to kill your weed seeds. So we're minimizing those weed seeds. Water only the root zones of the plants that you want. Use landscape fabric. Absolutely use some kind of a block on the bottom of your, of your bed. I don't have bottoms in my beds out in the garden. That's just a demonstration. I have made beds, uh, little boxes like this with teachers that they wanted to use it like around their school. Uh, but mine do not have bottoms in them. You've got to use something on the bottom to keep the weeds from coming up through because they will find their way through. Yeah, absolutely. So I lay my landscape fabric down, lay my box down on top of that, and then put my soil mix on, on top of that. Um, and landscape fabric or, or what? Or a bottom? Oh, landscape fabric by, by all means is cheaper, less expensive than... You could use cardboard. Cardboard is less organic, but definitely I have used, just because of the chemicals they used to make the cardboard. Yeah. I, I, last year I used cardboard. Yeah, last year I used cardboard in some of my beds and I used cloth in one of the others. Um, um, I would... I, the only time I would use a bottom in your box is if you're on a patio. That's the only time I would encourage patio or a rooftop somewhere that uh, you really just can't get away with without it. Oh yeah, actually, absolutely, absolutely. Um, weeding is very easy because it pulls out easy. It's a very loose, friable soil. Uh, your windblown seeds will, will get in there. You know, that's just a fact of life, but you're going to be able to identify them because they're not in the spacing. Can I just skip through something? Oh, there's that picture of what my garden was like the first year we were there, back in 2007, summer of 2007. We bought a rotiller rot 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 right before we started doing square foot gardening, but we still use it for those, those hill plant areas. Um, anybody ever had a garden turn like this? Yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, no more of that. No more of that. And then a harvest is just wonderful. When you harvest, think about what you're going to plant next. Try to rotate between your root crop, your leaf crop, your fruit crop. Rotate through that whole cycle so that you're not using the same nutrients from the soil, but each time you replant, you're going to put one trowelful of compost, mix it in that square, at least one trowelful mix it in that square and then replant with whatever you're going to do next. You have to add that compost because that's essentially your fertilizer. That's where your plant's going to get the nutrients. There we go. So that's where your potential for three crops comes, uh, by adding that trowel and rotating your crops. And that's going to help you with pest control as well. So what can you grow in one box? Had a cabbage, had a broccoli, had a cauliflower, romaine, red lettuce, salad, lettuce, and sugar snap peas, and Swiss chard, spinach, carrots, beets, beet greens, which that's honestly why I grow my beets is for the greens, and some long carrots and radishes. And if you extend that growing season, starting earlier in the spring, you don't have to wait for the ground to fall down. What I would recommend is that you cover your box to let that soil warm up a little bit. I actually even use a thermometer just to check and make sure that it's warmed up enough. Add some compost, plant, and then protect it as you need it. If you're going to garden later, mm -hmm. add to the, exactly, exactly. So you've got your cold, Sometimes things don't fulfill. Cool weather crops that you can be putting in any time now. Hot weather crops. And as some of you know, if you try to grow those cool weather crops, even planting them in June, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of success. Starting early, ways to warm that up, you might put an old window. 
you've got a, a window with the glass in it still, you can warm it up that way. I actually have uh, PVC pipe frames over mine, hoops that I, I put uh, heavier metal plastic over it, and it works very well. Um, you can do window plastic if you wanted. What I have is more like what, what is shown right here. So you're going to make a frame uh, and then put some plastic over top of it. Now, the thing is, your pepper plants, you're probably going to want to plant the plant itself in that garden once we're past frost. Okay? I, I would not recommend putting pepper plants in until after Memorial Day, really. And maybe some of you might have had some success a little before Memorial, but your tomatoes, your peppers, those really are hot weather crops, and you're better off waiting until June and not using plastic. I do want to caution you, once that sun really starts warming things up, you will need to, to open that plastic up during the day so that you're not roasting your plants, and then cover back, bring it back down at night to keep the, the warmth them. Because you can cook your plants with that plastic. And there's an up close of one of the frames. <coughs> and you'll see that person use string. And honestly, um, I, ha I have a combination of string and some permanent uh, grids. Here's another example. You can see where they've made more of a Conestoga wagon type of frame. And that is my, the, the very first frame I made was the crisscross like in the previous frame. What I have on one of my beds is like that. It's a little easier to access your plants that way. Um, you might find that you need protection from critters. And it doesn't matter whether you live in the city or in the country, you're going to need that protection. There are frames that you can make uh, and using chicken uh, coop wire, you, you can definitely protect from big and little critters. And all of those instructions are given in his book, and I'm pretty sure the Mansfield Library has that book, if I remember correctly. I presented it to the library last year, I was pretty sure they had that. It's not in from the library. Very good. <laughs> Confirmation there, I like that. So there's an up close of the protection. Now you're going to notice the trellis in the back, those are for your vining plants. Because your vining plants are going to need some support. Um, and you're going to train those vines as they grow to just go through that, that, that uh, lattice, so to speak. Um, so I'm going to finish up with just a few pictures of some community gardens that I'm familiar with. The first I'm going to cover is the Gilliam Park community down in Atlanta. My brother-in-law lives down there. And back then, I wanted to say about 2011, maybe, Bob called me and he said, Susan, I'd really love for you to come down and present this to our community center. This is inner city Atlanta, and most of the youth that were participating in this had never touched soil, ever. And so I brought the different mixes down, I had a bunch of different vegetable seeds. They have no idea where the vegetables even came from. And one young lady asked, she would gotten dirt on her hand, she says, how am I going to get this off? Soap and water? Go into the bathroom? She was serious. So. Anybody here involved in, like, literally community gardens? As you engage your community, you are going to run into members of that community that have zero experience with gardening. And you're going to need to ease that, them into that, um, assuring them that, sure, there are microbes, there's healthy bacteria in that soil, and if it wasn't there, you wouldn't be able to grow anything. But it washes off so easily. Don't worry about it. Um, and, and so. We went from a presentation and hands-on at the community center in the very next year, because you know, Atlanta for the most part can grow year-round for the most part. This is what it looks like now. And this is within walking distance of my brother-in-law's home um, and within walking distance of that community center. And it's very productive. They've, uh, let me back up to that. It is funded by a grant. Kirkwood is the name of the community. It's an inner city community. I mean, honestly, Bob and Mary could probably walk to downtown from where they live. And the Eastside Parks Network. So it is affiliated with the, the Atlanta Parks. Um, and so here's some of the, they do have a compost bins that the community uses. Uh, it is fenced in that helps keep maybe some of the dogs and cats out. 
They've got, they've elaborated, they've built on it, they've, they've put a picnic bench, they've got actually a bullet board now, um, so people can kind of communicate different things with folks. And so I've got pictures of with plants and without, and it's all square foot gardens, all square foot gardens, because that's what works for them. They're busy people, they're working every day just like us, and they found that the square foot method gave them that luxury of working on it just a little bit at a time as they could. Toledo grows. When I trained with, with Mel back in 2010, uh, <laughs> there, were, there was a group of young men from Toledo, I think it was all, all boys, um, upper teens, maybe early 20s, and they were there to learn square foot gardening for a program called Toledo Grows that is an extension program, a, a, an outreach program at the Toledo Botanical Gardens. And I was just really impressed with these young men. And you know, just like any young people, they weren't exactly comfortable speaking in front of people. Because part of the, the training was, you know, get up and present something. Well, they kind of fumbled through that. But you know, that, that takes time to, to develop that hack. Um, they went back to Toledo. And I, when I, these are all pictures from Facebook. So they're kind of public pictures. But I kind of picked and chose which pictures really represent that what they're doing, they have some phenomenal gardens up there and what a community effort they've got. And my guess is they don't have a concrete floor to work on putting their boxes together, but they've made do. And they've used inner city areas, I'm assuming gotten, have, having gotten permission to, to uh, retrofit these areas for gardens and have just done amazing things. And I, I just love, you know, the, the sense of unity these pictures give of the camaraderie in that community. And that brings me to the conclusion of this presentation. I want to direct you to the squarefootgardening.org website. If you go to squarefootgardening.com, it's actually their, their page where they sell different items. The .org is actually more informational. Um, those of you that do Facebook, the Facebook name for where you really, there's a bunch of different Facebooks that mention square foot gardening. Different groups have, have started their own pages. But the official one is Mel Bartholomew's official all new square foot gardening. And that's one that Mel himself contributes to. He is quite the gentleman, let me tell you. Uh, very cantankerous, very, very exact, uh, typical to an engineer. He, he likes things done right. And uh, with that said, though, the humanitarian side of him recognizes that not everybody can do everything the same way. So his words were, just do it. Do it with what you have. Um, and, and that's what really sold me on, on Square Foot Gardening. And I hope it has sold you as well. Just a couple minutes for questions, I think. Yes. Um, you're showing the wood, but they also at the beginning you had concrete blocks, rocks. Mm -hmm. Just the measurements are what are important, and the grid is important. You're just going to to make sure the measurements are are what you need. A, a max of four foot. Okay. And absolutely, you can use whatever materials you have. I think the, the stone ones look beautiful, yep. but I don't have access to stone. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to leave this up here. If you want to see what peat moss is or feels like, if you've never experienced that, or the coarse vermiculite, um, one word about the vermiculite. Vermiculite comes in lots of different sizes. Uh, I should say three or four anyways, maybe an extra fine, fine, medium, and coarse. You want to use the coarse. Personally, when I'm starting plants that I know are going to eventually go out into that garden, it comes in different grades or sizes, and you want to use the coarse, which is the big pieces. But when I'm starting my plants inside, and I know they're going to go out there, I actually have picked up some of the really fine vermiculite too, and, and have a different mix of mels that I start my plants in, and then just move them on out. And so if you want to see what any of those look like, take a look at any of the posters or the box that I've got for the little <laughs> corners. As I said, I'm not in a hurry. Come on up if you need information about vermicomposters. Uh, I can give you more information about that as well.
Thank you.